All right, so um, welcome everyone who's made it to the Write the Docs uh, pandemic edition. I know that's probably a word not to be thrown around lightly, um, but this is a very interesting sort of a meeting. We've, um, we live in strange, interesting times, so um, we've decided to get someone who is probably share, more than happy to share the experiences with how the technical communication industry is shaping around in the times of pandemic. I just wanted to, before I start, um, can everyone hear me okay? If you just give me a thumbs up sign. Yeah, okay, excellent. So I'll just start sharing my screen. I've just got a couple of introductory slides about um, Write the Docs Australia, so. Yeah. Okay. Right, okay, so th this is the agenda for today. We've got a slight intro, a small introduction and just welcoming our guests for this event today. Um, we've got Kirk St. Amand talking about this, his article that he recently published around the technical communication, how technical communicators are helping uh, in this current times. And also we've got Tom Johnson who's just recently published a survey um, around finding out people's, I guess, perceptions of how the tech, how the pandemic has affected their um, industry or, or their personal circumstance. And then at the end of that, we've, uh, we've got a facilitated discussion. Sarah Maddox will have some questions for our guests today. And then we've got, uh, so if you've got any questions for our guests and just generally you can put them in the chat window, which I think like Sarah pointed out, three dots on the right, or actually it's on the right, top right window uh, of your window, you'll have a chat functionality. If you want to put in your questions, we've got Gaurav joining us from Brisbane who will be moderating these questions and we'll have these um, as part of the conversation in the latter part of the event. Um, let me just jump back and try and um, stop presenting. I just want to let, okay. There's a few people still trying to get in. Um, okay, so if you haven't been to one of the Ride right, the Docs event before, it's a series of conferences and local meetups focused on all things related to documentation. So it's the, the key word here is documentation. So it's people who document as part of their um, um, work. So you don't necessarily have to be a technical writer. You could be a developer, UX designer. It's your passion. It's your uh, belief in the art of um, documentation, which this whole community is about. Um, like any other event, we've got a code of conduct. Be friendly and welcoming. Be respectful and be careful in the words that you choose. If you believe someone's violating the code of conduct during one of our events, please contact a member of the staff. Just a quick note on the Write the Docs Australia um, community. We've got about close to 800 members coming up in the last four years now. We've had about 45 meetup events across all the major cities, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, and also remote events where we've had guests from overseas try and um, you know, share their experiences and knowledge of technical communication, relate, topics related to technical communication. Uh, to our community, we've had we've already had three annual conferences um, for Write the Docs Australia, and that's they've been pretty awesome, really. So um, that's that's the community, the Write the Docs Australian community in a nutshell. How do you get involved with Write the Docs? Hopefully, a lot of you would have probably seen this on the meetup channels or LinkedIn or the Slack, the Write the Docs Slack. There's also the mailing list. You can join the mailing list at Write the Docs. Dot org, and there's a whole list of uh, meetups happening all over the globe as we speak. So feel free to join in. I think most of the events would probably be remote at some stage. So um, this is your opportunity to join in and contribute to the community. And that's probably me with my slides. I'm just going to quickly introduce our guests for today. Uh, we've got Tom Johnson. Joining us, he's a 
senior tech writer for Amazon in California. He's best known for his blog, I'd Rather Be Writing, which has one of the largest followings in the technical community, uh, technical communication community. He's also created an extensive online API course that probably has helped millions of people, I would say, right? Technical writers transition into API documentation. And then we've also got Kirk St. Amand, who's uh, joined us from Louisiana, is um, is the Ennis Williamson Chair in the Technical Communication at Louisiana Tech University, where he's also a member of the University's Center for Biomedical Engineering and Rehab Science. And he also serves as the Director of University's Center for Health and Medical Communication. Um, so I'm, I, I'm conscious of the time. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to switch over to, um, I'll probably get invite Kirk to talk about his article that he recently published um, around how technical communicators can help um, in this in these times, and we'll follow that up by Tom Johnson, who will then talk about his survey and some interesting results from the survey. So over to you, Kirk. If you want to share your screen, that should be OK. I'm going to go on mute for a second. I'll just let a few more people in. I just, just stop the pinging in the background. So over to you, Kirk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Swat Mill. Thank you for the chance to speak and for this chance to interact with you all. And hopefully, it'll be a, dis a discussion more than a monologue. Um, very quickly, one of the things that we were noticing here in the United States as COVID-19 began to progress was the breakdown of society, which I think everyone has experienced. Things from hospitals were being flooded to fistfights were breaking out in supermarkets to people had no idea what was going on at work even when they were showing up. And the question became, why are these things happening? And in conversations with individuals at the local level, as well as with colleagues across the country, a weird thing was going on where the protocols we have for how to live life were breaking down. And essentially, we didn't have user docs that tell us how to behave in times of a pandemic crisis. And the more you research it, you realize that this problem, when we've got a lack of user docs on how to behave in a pandemic, seems to occur every time there is this kind of crisis whether it's the Spanish flu of 1918 or the SARS epidemic that happened at the turn of this millennium. These similar patterns repeat. Individuals need instruction sets to tell them how to behave. And it turns out that when you look at it, the need of these instructions is not random. We need these user docs across certain domains to maintain stability. Um, one of the things that it's likened to is a script in a play. You've been cast for a play and you show up at the theater, but nobody tells you what your role is, what your dialogue is, what props you'll use, or how you get onto or off the stage. Panic ensues, and with that panic, you don't know what to do. You need someone to provide you with guidance. It turns out that the user docs we need are instructions that tell us when and how to visit hospitals to seek care how to engage in self-diagnosis to see, do we need to visit a hospital or to stay away? But then seemingly more banal things that affect everyday life. Uh, things as simple as at going to the grocery store is a matter of knowing how to plan meals, which is a matter of knowing how to plan shopping, which is a matter of knowing then what to look for and how to request it when you get to a grocery store. These are all procedures. Um, simple things like going out in society to care for individuals who live off site. How do we do that safely? Or can we do it with a technological option? What are the options available to us? Well, how do we install them? How do we talk our elderly family members who we need to visit offsite through the process of installing these things? These are all things that technical communicators do every day. And it turns out they're the linchpin factors that if these kinds of user docs are available in advance, they can prevent society from going into panic mode. And so there are different procedures that I've been working with both locally and with other colleagues in the US to hopefully try to develop to ease things as we go into a state of reopening again, but also to prepare for the next time an event like this takes place. And with that, I'd like to transition over to Tom, who's done a great deal of work on what is actually going on and how it's affecting the field. OK. Uh, so. I actually received a, an email from somebody the other day, actually a month and a half ago, uh, who had experienced layoffs in their company. Um, they basically were freaked out. They had five people in their tech pubs group and three suddenly got laid off. Not this person, but they were really quite, quite scared. And they started to wonder, you know, we, we, we always have to fight for resourcing. We're last priority, you know, um, 
is our end, you know, just around the corner. And I started wondering, well, what is the impact of the pandemic specifically on the tech writer, tech writing sort of uh, industry on the market, um, <clears throat> specifically, you know, careers and, and so forth. And so I, I created just a simple survey, nothing super well thought out, but wanted to just kind of gut check to see what the results are. And I'll paste those in the chat. You can check them out. Uh, basically, uh, um, the results were reassuring in terms of like job stability because only 5% of the people mentioned that they had lost their job due to COVID. Um, but 39%, and by the way, about 250 people took this survey. Uh, I didn't promote it that, that much. It's just sort of a, sort of a, I don't know, caught on a life of its own in terms of responses. 39% of people are working more each day. Um, I find that really interesting and I'll return to that. 39% of people have gained weight. 28% have taken up a new hobby. Uh, 13% have either been furloughed or had their salary reduced. 39% had open headcount reduced or cut. 48% experienced better audio in meetings. You can hear people. 11% uh, are creating more content for self-serve scenarios. 37% have seen a, an increase in traffic on their doc site. 32% say it's easier to find information because the online footprints are larger. 16% say their budget for online training has been reduced or cut. In response to the question, how will the pandemic impact TechCom in the long term, which is more speculative, 48% say that work from home will be more acceptable. 18% say the job market will be more competitive. 11% say that there will be an increased demand for tech writers due to cutbacks on call centers and other live support. And 14% say there will be more focus on projects related to media, gaming, meditation, online commerce, and other areas thriving in the pandemic. Now, the nice thing about this survey uh, and the, the sort of reassuring part is to see that only 5% have lost their jobs, at least so far, right? Who knows what's to come? So that sort of allays the the initial fears that this person who reached out to me, you know, it, it, are layoffs gonna be tremendous and huge? And at least across the industry, 5% isn't nearly the, the uh, equivalent to the other levels. Um, but I, I do have some thoughts on um, the increased amount that people are working because I find this to be the most interesting with 39% of people saying that they're working more you know why is it I mean we we suddenly don't have to commute to work all the events that we'd normally have canceled right no no soccer practice no PTA meetings or whatever uh, so why are we working more well I think there are several reasons one is that it gives us a sense of normalcy. Work is uh, kind of the one thing we can do that we we know is uh, common, consistent, part of our attempt to reclaim normalcy. Um, so it gives some focus and meaning. Maybe there's a fear of job security. You wanna make sure that you're present and doing a great job so that you're not laid off. Um, I also think that because the online footprint is larger, it's easier for people to include you in email threads, to include you in online meetings, to add you as a, to mention you in a document or some ticket. And so you just sort of get pulled into all these different directions that before when we were more grouped physically, it was less common, right? People were always complaining, oh, I wasn't in that meeting or I didn't hear about that. Well, now you do hear about all that and it suddenly like pulls you really stretches you thin, right? Um, there are probably, probably some other reasons, you know, but, uh, I, and, and who knows, like the sense of time is all distorted. I'm, I don't think people are meticulously logging their time. Uh, so, uh, you know, with a more flexible schedule, how do you really even know that you're working more? Um, it's kind of hard to say, but in general, um, I, I do think people are in fact working more. Um, all right. So that's, basically my my main comment and uh we save the rest for other discussion points
I'll turn it back to swap now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Kirk. Um, so that's that's really interesting in the terms of patterns and what we what we tr currently trying to do. So I think we've got Sarah Maddox who's got a, a few questions that she'll try and facilitate between you and have some sort of a discussion. So over to you, Sarah. Yes, thanks, Swapnil. Hi. Um, thanks both Tom and Kirk. Those are super interesting presentations and articles. I found the results very, very interesting. Um, what I'd like to do is start off with a few specific questions. We'll start off with one for Kirk and then one for Tom. And then we'll have some more questions that are kind of more discursive amongst the two, between the two of you. So starting off with Kirk, um, thanks for that excellent article on the role of communication professionals in a pandemic. What I'm wondering is, have you received any indication of support from any tech com or government organizations? And leading on from that, are there any resulting thoughts on taking the strategies through to implementation? Um, great questions. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, what's been interesting is since I've written about this, the folks who've reached out to ask me about how do we move to the next stages of post pandemic? Um, again, we're back to there's no user guide for that. How do we go about doing this to maintain social distancing? One of the comments that came through in Tom's survey was someone said, we're probably going to default to the way we used to do things because it's just reflexive for us. And I think we're seeing individuals say we can't let that happen yet because it will cause a resurgence of a, an infection. And so I've been contacted more recently by um, the Louisiana Department of Public Health to chat with them about how do we create workshops that are communication based, that look at how do we create the communication protocols that tell individuals how to do everything from congregate in parking lots, to enter buildings, to move through hallways, to sit in meeting spaces. Um, I'll be teaching a course this summer for different high schools in the state of Louisiana, where myself and some colleagues who work in communication have been asked, can you help us come up with protocols for how to return to schools? But what's been interesting about that is they realize an expertise that you see in technical communication in terms of audience and the generation of user docs, because they don't want us to develop the protocols for them. They want us to work with their students who are going to be the actual users of these materials to figure out what should these protocols and procedures be. And the idea is not only to help the students develop these protocols, these user docs, but to teach them how to user test them and to engage in kind of the overall process. So if you will, we're seeing TechCom become part of the high school curriculum in some ways. So that's been kind of fun and interesting follow-ups to these kinds of things. Um, in terms of implementation, both of the things I've talked about, ideally over the course of the summer, we're going to see come to fruition where something will come out of them. I think ideally it'll be working with these entities, with folks like yourselves, um, with other technical communicators in the field to figure out how can we come up with strategies for dealing with this in the future. And uh, best, basically best practices. We can't come up with the end results, but we can come up with best best practices for understanding the situation and for addressing it through what we do. But that recognition has been very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. That, that is super cool. I'm really pleased to hear that the state of Louisiana is so uh, forward thinking. That's, that's really nice to hear. Um, just a reminder to, to everyone on this call, if you hear something that Kirk says or Tom says that kind of triggers a question in your mind or an idea, put it into the chat because Gaurav is monitoring the chat and he will pick up those questions and ask them in the next section of this call. Alrighty, so Tom, one for you. Um, yeah, thanks for an amazing set of statistics um, that you read out just recently from people in our industry. So my overall impression from kind of looking down the graphs and the survey results is not much has changed. <laughs> is that a correct impression, would you say? Well, yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think that does seem like the impression, right? We go to work as usual at home and we still have our projects. It's just a different mode. But at the same time, everything has changed, right? Um, and I think some of these percentages may not seem may not jump out at us as being that huge, but I do think they they 
paint a story of kind of what's happening, um, especially that percentage about people working more, 39% of people reporting that they're working more. Uh, I think the trend is that we're going to, we're going to experience increased um, drain on our own bandwidth, right? That people need docs for self-service scenarios more than before. You pulled in more directions, being pulled in more meetings and more threads and more more tickets and discussions. No one's taking vacations, right? So people are just working full full throttle. You've got people in different time zones that can communicate all, at any time, right? And you know how often do you turn off your your chat and your email? Um, at the same time of the, having this increased workload, we also see a decrease in resourcing. People saying that that their open headcounts are cut. I'm sure that even if they haven't lost their jobs, they're probably having hiring freezes. And so uh, we're going to have to figure out how to do more with less, right? We've always had this, but now I think it's turned up a notch. How do you clone yourself? Um, because, of course, you want to always, uh, you don't want to slack off, especially now, right? Um, so that challenge will potentially cause some shift in the way we work. Maybe when people request documentation, we'll put the burden back on them to create the content and we'll act more as editors and publishers. Maybe that's what we're already doing. Maybe you have a different role. But I know that um, in my work, we work with a lot of different engineering groups and sometimes I write the content, sometimes we write the content. Uh, but I kind of see myself moving more towards this model of being the editor and the gatekeeper and the standards bearer and so forth and and publishing and orchestrating that rather than writing their content uh, which is the hard part really um so anyway maybe you have other strategies maybe you see different insights into this but uh <clears throat> that that's kind of how i i read the trends there yeah, super cool. Thanks. Um, I posted a question in the chat, which Gaurav can uh, ask you afterwards as well. Um, actually, it's for both of you. Um, so my next question is is for both of you, but we'll start with Kirk, and then uh, Tom can perhaps respond. So looking at Tom's survey, um, there are several interesting data patterns. Tom has already mentioned quite a few. Um, Kirk, does any pattern in particular strike you? Um three weird things about Tom's data and his, the comments comments that he received on it that I think are surprising. I mean, most of his data falls into two brute force categories. We are drastically rethinking the nature of work and we're drastically rethinking the nature of the work day. Something is going on that's causing us to restructure how we think about work day and work week. And what does that mean in terms of how we'll perceive of that moving forward? Um, the other thing is the amazing stability, even though there were cuts of the job market for TechCom, Given that when you read many of the financials out there, Techcom is often lumped in with the series of skill sets that might be seen as being washed away or supplanted by AI. And yet it remains strong. Not only did it remain strong, but when you look at some of the comments that Tom's survey produced, technical documentation departments took the place of AI. That is the roles that were thought would be supplanted by AI, um, call centers, project management to some extent, user testing, a number of comments noted that we've taken that on now. And so the question becomes the uptick in work that folks have re reported, is that because we're assuming roles that we will continue to fulfill in the future? And that maybe we'll no longer be seen as a skill set that can be replaced by a piece of technology or an algorithm, but a crucial creation mechanism, as Tom pointed out, we're, the editing factor that we can bring to existing content. Is that something that will change the nature of our value moving forward? So those are things I'm really interested in seeing what happens in relation to moving forward. That missing piece that wasn't reported, the great AI wave that was supposed to shift our field drastically didn't happen. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that, I mean, that's very encouraging, right? To, to not just be the first um, kind of tear snipped away by AI or by, by other factors. I think it is reassuring. Um, I also think there's another another element um, to job security. And that's when you're the only sort of person who knows the authoring and publishing tools and system and process, it seems a lot more risky for companies to get rid of that function. Of course, if you have a team of 20 or 30 writers or even five to 10, it's a lot easier, right? But uh, 
by and large, in another survey I did, like 34% of dev doc writers are lone writers, right? And so um, in some ways, if you're the lone possessor, possessor of, of knowledge about publishing in your company, it's kind of a critical, uh, critical skill that you bring. Great. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Um, so here's another question for both of you. We'll start with Tom. So what was your favorite response in the kind of free comment sharing part of the survey? Uh, yeah, I think there were a lot of great comments, actually. And part of the reason I wanted to do the survey is because I feel like um, my blog has visibility and so I can tap into like collective wisdom from the community and uh, whatever I want to know, like I can plug into people's minds and, and it's quite amazing. Um, one of one of the persons said that this is the great equalizer for remote workers. I think that's dead on, right? If you were a remote worker in the past, you were often overlooked, not included. You know, now you're just one of the you're right on the level playing field. And I know there are many people who are very excited about working from home because they've been doing it or they've wanted to do it. So this is really like proving it out. Um, <clears throat> another person said that, uh, well, they said that in their company, the projects are just increasing because no one is taking vacations. And I see you also put a comment about, you know, is that going to uh, escalate stress levels? I think for sure, like burnout, stress, these, this is inevitable, right? Uh, today, I actually was feeling burned out and stressed. I was like, man, I had a uh, I'd uh, taken an early morning bike ride following the same route I had used to take and then going to the park and was, all these memories came back to me and I was like, man, so much uh, has changed. Another person mentioned that, that um, you know, this pandemic hits people who have small children a lot harder than others because now you've suddenly got to do your work full time while taking care of your children or not, right? My kid has watched so much Garfield and I feel bad about it, right? But what do I, what do you do? Um, Cause the workload's increasing and now summer is gonna hit, which is gonna make it even worse, right? But just the whole disruption of the family life has been been huge. It's been, uh, <clears throat> for me, the, the hardest, right? Although if people don't have family, maybe, maybe there's a whole other set of challenges around uh, solitude and isolation. Anyway, those those are just a few of the comments. A lot of people left other comments, and um, you know, uh, somebody else just asked, "What happens if you do the survey in a month or two from now?" And yeah, hopefully things will change, and maybe for the for the better or or for the worse. Who knows? But uh, it is interesting to sort of gauge what exactly is the, at least the job loss rate, right? That's kind of a probably the main one, um, <clears throat> and to see where that needle is falling. Good. How about you, Kirk? Did you share the same uh, favorite comment as Tom, or do you have a different one? Um, again, my favorites are with with Tom on the homeschooling comments, or the you know our workday changing is one thing; their workday changing is a whole different thing. Um, and first of all, I'm wondering all the people who the 11 percent who reported they're doing projects on the side are they creating education where that they're not going to start marketing because they realize there'll be a huge market for quality um, home home education products? Because I can see that happening. Um, but the other weird thing is, as someone who does homeschool, and our children do homeschool, you become this repository where your time is taken up by everybody asking you, can we borrow this? Can we borrow? It's like the neighbor who keeps coming over to borrow your ladder. And so can we use this? Can we use this? And you're, eventually a friend says, why aren't you selling this? And you go, so it'll be curious to see, I mean, the expertise is in our field to do these kinds of things and to use different technologies to do it. Are, is a technical communicator going to restructure the education market? by realizing people are now aware of this market, let's go for it. Um, that, Tom, the 11%, uh, excuse me, the 40% of people who gained weight, man, that is a home health care plan market waiting to happen. <laughs> I'm waiting for someone to tap that because as a middle-aged guy in fair shape, you get on the YouTube and it's all designed for 20-year-old people who can get that beach body in two weeks. I want something for the 50-year-old guy who just doesn't want to, you know, lose 10 pounds. I want to be able to get up every morning. So I want to see, you know, that's a perspective thing to emerge that I think we can tap into. So I'm waiting for those to happen. Elon Musk's got nothing on us. We can take this. 
<laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> tech come take over the world. Um, so just to finish off this section, we have a few minutes left. I'd like to ask a question that Tom actually proposed, um, and I'll ask it of both of you. So given that, you know, we're working more each day, or at least a, a fairly large proportion of us are, what are some of the things that technical writers may be neglecting? So if you're working more, are you um, missing out on being with your family? Um, <laughs> Kirk already mentioned that you may be missing out on dieting or more healthy pursuits. What are we missing out on? Um, I'll ask Tom first. Well, I think um, at least in the API doc space, if you want to stay marketable, you have to really devote some time each day to learning something, right? If you just never never go through any course or, or technical uh, tutorial or whatever, your skills dull. Uh, but carving out that time, one hour a day or, or something is really difficult. Um, and I think that, at least in my, in my time, has been the first thing to slip. But that's sort of the very thing that keeps you marketable, right? If you if you suddenly lose your job and you're back on the market, uh, employers are going to, want to, going to want to know how technical are you? Uh, are you going to be able to understand our products and our technology? And if you say yes, well, what proof do you have? And you point to other things you know. So that neglect is is huge. Of course, the family one as well. But uh, just focusing on more of the tech com career, um, I, I really think we can fall into this trap of just like, trying to write and respond to all these you know tickets without actually furthering and deepening our, our learning and knowledge which is um essential mm, that's a very good one yeah thanks tom how about you kick um for me i think it's thinking about making a shift to more central figures in management now where this kind of massive work shift from on-site to off-site only happens if you've got the structural the informational structure in place, the tech docs in place, the procedures in place to make such moves seamlessly. And I think for many of us, we've seen organizations stumble through that. And the realization that we can't do this again, the losses were catastrophic. And we need people who understand these procedures to create the documentation, the protocols, oversee the transition by knowing what is going on, knowing these procedures. So I think it's a chance to talk about renegotiating value and what role technical communicators have in the value of organizations in managing processes, overall production processes, not just documentation ones. Because now I think the world's acutely aware that communication is key to success. And how can we maximize this point in time to move forward in that role? Super cool. Technical communicators as techcom evangelists, basically. Yeah. In fact, I like our <laughs> Can we go with Buddhist monks instead? <laughs> yeah, we're um we're a little bit like a marketing team in that marketing teams are uniquely set up to market themselves, and we're uniquely set up to describe our value. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, forgive me. I'm going to be intrusive. I'd ask a question to the group. I mean, how many people here had someone outside their division ask them to explain a process to them, or ask them to generate some sort of documentation on the fly to how to do something? Oh, see all these heads nodding. I think think about that. It's it's kind of like you know we joke about I'm doing your job for you, but suddenly we're this is a very crucial skill set, and I think it's a moment of realization. How do we maximize that? Super cool. All right, um, over to Goro to lead the the public um, discussion. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we had a few questions from the chat. Uh, before I ask those ones, I had uh, my own two questions uh, for each of you, Kirk and Tom. So my first question to Kirk, um, um, most of it you have already covered when answering Sarah's question. It's related to the implementation. Um, can any of uh, us help or is like, do you have already plans laid out on how to uh, like put together uh, these resources you are talking about and uh, like will it be access available for everyone like on GitHub or open source thing where uh, everyone can contribute? Your thoughts about that? 
Um, great question. I had not planned it, but I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, I mean, pretty much what I tried to put together was a loose set of guidelines that anybody in technical communication could take a look at and say, I can do this. Um, the biggest thing is awareness raising. A lot of these problems break down at the local level where we live. And most of the documentation folks are using is designed at the national level. And in many ways, we become that bridge, whether it's our employer or the local school system or the local healthcare facility. They need us to let them know what they need and to help them develop those systems. So back to Sarah's comment about technical communicators as evangelists, I think that's the big kind of takeaway, making communities aware of what it is that we do and how to value it so that whenever a child goes to a career night and someone says, would you like to be a technical communicator? You don't have to spend 20 minutes and you know draw a diagram so that they know what that means. They realize the, the importance of it because they've seen it. Right on. <laughs> Well, I definitely would want to, uh, uh, I'd say, like, not everyone is uh, so, like, outgoing and uh, being an evangelist and talking to people about, uh, 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 like, showing the value if, uh, if something comes up and easily accessible or um, have people to take on available on GitHub and contribute, it will be really helpful. So yeah. And uh, to Tom, um, do you want to reopen the survey again? And like, just uh, because you mentioned that only 250 people uh, responded to the survey, do you want to like do it again and probably advertise it more so that uh, like more people can respond and get better numbers you know i'm i'm pretty whimsical when it comes to surveys i uh, i know that um yeah it, it would be nice to have a baseline and to to do more in depth actually i think 250 is is fine i mean when you mm -hmm. uh do ux stuff jared uh, what's his name uh pool whatever he says all you need is four to five people to get uh, uh, an 80 percent accurate response or something right so mm -hmm. i think that Thank you, Spool. Um, I, I think even if you have 50 to 100, it's probably fine because I, you start to see the percentages don't really change after you get to a certain amount. Um, and it's probably skewed because I yeah, just promote it to my blog and Twitter and so forth and LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I like to just do surveys about things I'm interested in. So I'll probably change my interest in a couple of months. Um, <laughs> I know that, that academics are much more trained to do better and more well thought out and, and proven surveys that can actually be data you can build on. Uh, I was just trying to do like a gut check, you know, um, trying to catch the pulse of something in the moment, which may be completely different in two months. So, Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Okay, taking on questions from chat now. Um, So uh, you already talked about uh, stress levels. Uh, do you have any pointers on how we can help reduce that? Um, anything you do to? Well, I, I've uh, I don't necessarily have pointers about reducing stress, but I, I will note that um, the, the part of Amazon that I work at is the devices organization, like Fire TV, Fire tablets. So you kind of get a sense of like what apps people are using and mm -hmm. like meditation apps are very popular as well as uh, like beach body apps, right? Exercise apps <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, even like ABC mouse type stuff, educational apps, you know, people are reading more on Kindle. The use of devices has gone, has gone way up because uh, mm -hmm. media is a form of comfort and, uh, and distraction, right? Um, I don't think the methods for reducing stress are any different from all the wisdom you've heard from other sources. So I don't have any particular insight there, but I do like, I like Kirk's, uh, the, the post COVID essay about rewriting the scripts in your head, because I think that's really the challenge. Like, you know, I have certain scripts in my head about how life should be and about how I want to go about it. And this, this, 
time is so difficult because we're re reconfiguring those scripts. We're rewriting them. And I don't really like the, the new version. I don't like the new draft. Right. So I'm trying to figure out how I can rewrite that script in a way that makes it more fun. Um, but, but I haven't, I haven't really thought beyond that to, to actually arrive at that. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. A any pointers from you, Kirk? Um, I'm one of the people who downloaded 10 versions of Tom's meditation app. Um, so <laughs> I I'm big on that. But um, one thing I think, as a YouTube geek, as I think I've already figured that out, what's interesting is watching the trends in three areas that have really taken off. Um, teach yourself Taoism, teach yourself Zen, and the self-styled Stoic. You know, these kinds of three areas but all things that you have little control over your external environment, live in the now. Um, I'm curious to see how that mindset affects things moving forward. And many of the things that Tom has talked about in terms of this worldview we take on things, how do we think about work, childcare, thinking about life moving forward, will we take that more kind of Zen, live in the moment, let's think about what's going on approach? Or will it be more back to the nine to five routine again? Will the subroutine kick in and we just keep going? Um, I'm with Tom. I don't want to rewrite. I'd like to think or to re repeat. I'd like to rewrite. And what's the best way to do that collectively that makes it successful? Great. Um, so we had one more question regarding uh, the survey, and it's mostly about what are your thoughts on repercussion of COVID situation on job um, a few months after now? So like Tom already said, I think I, um, he probably won't do another survey uh, right now. But uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, who, who knows, right? That's in, in my mind, that's the biggest fear is like this huge, huge layoff. But I think in any market, we we risk being laid off, and the same strategies you would use to, to maintain yourself as marketable seem to equally apply. Um, so, you know, keeping your your skill skill set sharp, uh, deepening your knowledge, getting together portfolio, you know, all this stuff is is always good, and and, and hopefully you wouldn't have to use it, but then you would you would already have it. Um, sorry, don't really have any insight there. I, I try to just stick with, you know, the, the survey said right now, 5% of people have lost their job. I, I, you don't want to hear me speculate. I have no, no insight more than anybody else. Yep. Um, people also reported that uh, in, in addition to uh, like more emails and more uh, them roped into other things, uh, grunt work. Uh, it also increased. I'm um, kind of curious about that. What, what do you mean grunt work increased? Like you uh, suddenly... Yeah, so someone said I found the opposite just this week. Two projects that I haven't been involved in are being put to me to own and provide the grunt, grunt work. So uh, huh. like it's probably more like people are getting more things to do, but nobody else wants to do, I guess. I think um, if the person who put that comment in, if you do want to unmute yourself and say something, that's that would be fine as well. If you if you don't want to, that's also great. Yeah. No, no, I'm more than happy to. Sorry, I'll just flick my webcam on. Um, yeah, so that was me. Um, basically, there's been a bunch of meetings that about, about these two projects that um, I had an idea were being worked on, but I wasn't involved in any of the sort of planning and, and set up and stuff. And now they've been sort of handed to me as like, hey, now you're going to, to own these projects. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just happened that two of them were this week. And I'm like, well, kind of, hey, how come I wasn't involved in the meeting? I've got these sort of I need this sort of clarification on this. And, you know, um, you know, how, how am I supposed to do, do that? And it's just, uh, yeah, it's kind of kind of given me a bit of frustration. In, uh, in that I've been left out of these uh, sort of planning meetings and discussions about how it's all going to work. And uh, I've just been told, hey, this is yours now. I think that scenario might become more common, even if tech comm doesn't experience tremendous layoffs. If people around other parts of the company are laid off, then the work comes to somebody, right? If you've ever had a teammate like leave your team, 
you know that that means more work for you, right? Uh, until you can backfill a position. And uh, maybe this is a chance to broaden your skill set. Now you're doing project management, it looks like. Um, uh, yeah, it's a, it, it's funny you mention that because I used to be a team of three and now I'm a lone writer. Um, but uh, I, I did mention it in another comment. I'm in the e-commerce uh, industry and uh, everything's like this, the whole isolation and COVID uh, situation has uh, been a massive boon for our customers in e-commerce because everyone's buying online now. It's, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, yeah. we, we're doing we're doing great. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's sort of I'm transitioning more into a bit bit more marketing and uh, and it's sort of customer support style uh, projects is is where they've where they've sort of landed. That that. Um, brings up uh, like a related point. Somebody else was asking um, I, on one of the questions. I was really curious to know if like TechCom would experience a boon, a boon, kind of like some of these other companies, right? If you're you make hand sanitizer or you make other popular products, you have an e-commerce, your DoorDash, you're suddenly like skyrocketing, right? And I wondered, well, with everybody going online and interacting and needing information and call centers closing and, and people uh, having to just like get information from online sources, yeah. is, is tech com undergoing a boon like that? Are we just like exploding in, in demand? Uh, but didn't really see that. So um, uh, I think a lot of, you know, the, the content that needs to be written is just going to be written by lots of different people. Um, not necessarily technical communicators you can't just grow them on trees. But uh, uh, I mean, that's part of the reason I wanted to do the survey because I wasn't sure if like it was going to be great for techcom or bad for techcom or looks like maybe a little bit of both. I don't know. Yeah. Um, thanks to Curtis for uh, clarifying things uh, for that question. Um, uh, next question is to both of you. Any thoughts on how the pandemic may have affected uh, the open source community? Um, any idea? Or uh, anyone in the audience who maintains a I mean, community? one thing for someone from the education side of, of things or, you know, public education, open source is kind of a godsend right now in terms of we don't have the technology to do X in the classroom. We need to know how to do it. We can't pay for it. Is there an open source option out there? So I, not only the interest in can we use it, but can we play with it? And so I think that ideally open source could be a, a mechanism through which you see more integrated activity between industry and education to try to figure out how to work together because we've each get different parts of the puzzle. So I'm curious to see how that evolves over time. Yeah, so I'm from the open source community and have been working with it for 10 years or so. And the communities I've been working with have been very volunteer based. And so consequently, and, and the distributed working is um, is core to what is happening. And so it, I, I don't actually see much change with regards to day to day practice of how people are working. But it's a community that has a whole lot of processes that are right, ready to be copied and duplicated and, and used. The other thing that I'm finding is that um, within this open source community, we, we have things that we can take forward and, um, and, and push out and, and, and help others with. Thanks, Cameroon. So, uh, have you noticed any like uh, contributions or open source contribution and like an increase in volume or anything like that? Uh, I, I haven't noticed, and, and I actually am not in a position to notice. But what I yeah. I have no what I am noticing is that people who are volunteers um, only spend time when they have spare time. On the open source community, and I have seen a few people who've had to step back a bit because of their other commitments. Um, I'm not so it, it's possible that there has been a cutback, but I tend to find that those sorts of things uh, bounce around a lot. There's a lot of noise in the open source community as people come in and out with the projects that they're working on.
Hey, hey Gaurav, can I can I ask a question? I'm just kind of looking at the chat, and I see we have Andrew Davis with us, and he I know he really uh, has a good feel for like the job market for tech writers in the Bay Area and yeah. elsewhere. I'm wondering maybe if he could uh, speak to trends he's seeing in the job market, at least in the Bay Area. Is it uh, is it you, you mentioned strong demand persisting? Yeah. What do you what trends do you see, Andrew? Do you do you mind uh, jumping in? You got got to unmute if you do. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> he's trying to unmute himself i think if you just click in the main area uh you um, should see like a little toolbar up here in the bottom of the screen just at the Mike, bottom, but, yeah yeah uh yeah i think you're unmuted well if he figures that out that'd be great if not uh you know, just looking at his comment seems to, seems to suggest that um, there's still a strong demand persisting, and maybe companies are more open to to remote workers. I mean, that that would be the long term trend that would be the most fascinating if companies flip the switch and really allow long term remote. I know that uh, a couple of companies, Twitter, Facebook, seem to already suggest they're allowing permanent remote, but with reduced salary or whatever. Uh, so, I mean that. That would change the workforce for substantially. I know that I, I would certainly move out of this area, move to much more livable and inexpensive area. Um, I'm not necessarily one who wants to work from home, but I know a lot of people who do work from home because of whatever situation they're in. Uh, it would be a real boon to them, them because they would be much more marketable. They wouldn't be that that exception that lives way out in the uh, in the middle of nowhere that you know <clears throat> has to qualify for a virtual position. But uh, that'll be an interesting trend to see. And maybe in a couple months, I'll, or actually, you wouldn't even need to do a survey. You could just look at company policies to find out if that, if that sort of spreads. Um, yeah, okay. Andrew says the Bay Area isn't slowing down at all. Some have frozen near term, but all want to hire and will, will as soon as they can secure budgets. So that's definitely good, and uh, I, I trust his his judgment. He certainly um, knows, like most of the companies in this area. Uh, of course, that's not Australia, but anyway. <laughs> um, so we have another question from Tom uh, about how will the pandemic impact tech communications in long term? Um, can you share your thoughts? Well, well, I think. Uh, I think we're going to see an uptick in, in self-serve type scenarios, right? Um, more better search, better findability of information. Um, I know that personally, I've been checking out Algolia lately. I want to integrate a much better search into my documentation. And I think uh, there are a lot of, there are a lot of like doc tools and others that, that um, have better built in search and findability. But I think that long-term, um, I think that will definitely be a trend and but yeah, I don't know. Does it, anybody else have any thoughts and insights on on that? I think like we previously uh, discussed that um, like now that we are in like being involved into more um, more things to do and more projects maybe uh, yeah will come out better as as evangelists <laughs> um, I'm just filtering through the chat Um, there are some comments and sorry, I'm, 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 like the chat window just closed and I've reopened it and uh, the scroll is went off. Uh, I'm just like uh, filtering through it. So uh, a question for Kirk. 
what level of uh, documents related to pandemic were you referring to that is needed? For example, uh, like for an individual company or a country, a state, or like we have need a global documentation set? Um, great question. Or all of the above. Yeah. I mean, ideally all of the above, but the, real, the reality of it is at the local level. Um, not just within industries themselves, but the communities that industries are a part of. Most of our national governments have come up with some sort of protocol. In the United States is the CDC, and it's done at a very abstract high level. It gets distributed down to the next level of government and is adapted for that level, but at some point it stops, and it still remains in the abstract. This is what you can do in theory with no one taking the last step to say at the local on the ground pragmatic level, what do we actually need? Who is our actual end user? What are they actually trying to do? And it's at that level where there's, I think the greatest need for any kind of documentation that tells people what to do, how to t monitor their health, how to check on their health, how to check on others, how to help others download needed technologies. Um, you know, Curtis and Tom mentioned shopping online. That's great if you fall within a certain demographic, but for folks like my father's generation I'm thinking of, to whom that's completely new and are dependent upon adult children to help them, that's a very different animal to train for. Um, and so that becomes a challenge area. So those local level concerns that are quite often left for somebody to pick up are an area that we're desperately needed in. And that's kind of where I get into this. It was at that local level. We don't know how to do this. What do we do? Thanks, Kirk. Um, uh, question to Tom that, because you mentioned learning and uh, like how we need to keep learning new things. So, about missing out on technical education due to working longer, what strategies can we use within a workplace to get those extra knowledge? Um, any thoughts? Well, one strategy that somebody recommended in another discussion was to look for learning opportunities within your own company. Uh, this is especially common in larger companies. They might have your own engineering excellence group that has uh, other training. That way you'll feel a little more connected to your workplace, not, not as if you're off in left field uh, on some <clears throat> other site, you know, doing something completely um, unrelated to work. But yeah, if you can take advantage of any resources at your work, that's great. Or just try to find um, something related to a project you're working on so that it's much more relevant. Um, but I, I, I think there's also just a need to not feel as if we have to go at a breakneck pace and to push back on the this um i i get this what do you call it um uh, feeling like i have to be ever present as soon as somebody ch uh, chats with me we use chime uh, as, somebody, as soon as somebody emails me you know people almost expect immediate response and and that completely fragments any kind of focus right if if every time you, you get into something somebody starts a chat with you and pulls you into some different direction, you're never going to get much flow, right? So that is very difficult right now to somehow turn off the instant chat because it's almost like you're, you're sort of become invisible to people. And it's, it's weird if you're offline or if you have a do not disturb notice. Um, but honestly, there, there's, uh, it's like, it has to be done. Um, if you want to, to find that time. So, Thanks. Um. I'm just going to quickly uh, jump in here. I've got a more of a comment than a question for Kirk. I think I was, I was part of a user research um, workshop a couple of days this week. And I think a lot of participants in the user research course um, mentioned how trustworthy or how information on different websites or how the all right, let me, let me start over again. What, what they were trying to do was, we were trying to interview each other in terms of what sources do we go to to find out information and how trustworthy these websites or these sources are. And I think that's where the communication that we create, produce, I guess is, is uh, important because 
how, why would someone come to visit your website like if it's a government website but it's still the information is not updated regularly or something why would they even come to your website they'd rather go to a newspaper site that you know the different that's polling different resources so it's like i said it's more of a comment but um Kirk, do you, do you, do, you, uh, do you see something like that happening too like in terms of way we contribute to makes makes for more impact um great question i i mean government officials are smes for the most part they speak their own technical language and they need someone to provide them with plain language training if you will or to create technical docs that helps them interact with society and so i think it's a matter of helping individuals realize that tech docs are for more than just hardware or software they're for lifeware that every interaction you have that is outside of a certain group of people with a certain kind of knowledge is non-transferable you need someone that's got an expertise in understanding audience content, content delivery, user assessment, those kinds of things to help them understand how to convey ideas. That's going to be the key to it. So you mentioned credibility. If you look at many organizations, they dump a lot of time and effort into the visual side of things, which is grand. But at the end of the day, you and I need some sort of text to tell us what to do with those visuals. And that's something that often is left until the last minute, but it's the single most important part. And so when I mentioned like agencies asking to collaborate, a lot of it is about language. How do we fine tune the language of things for an audience to understand it? And I, again, I think it's, it's the key. Credibility comes down to, do you speak in my voice in a way I understand and that I trust you based on how you talk to me? That's something that only folks with our expertise can really master and work with to give credibility to different organizations. And I think this situation has made lots of agencies acutely aware of that factor. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have a sort of follow-up question for Kirk, if I can ask. Um, I feel like a lot of the instruction that we see related to COVID stuff is pretty plain. Like think about face masks, for example, or distancing. Uh, but in every communication, there's a rhetorical element too uh, around persuasion, right? It's not just about clear clarity, but persuading your audience to act in a certain way. Um, what what kind of guidance do you have around that persuasive element? Uh, like what, what can we do? Let's take, for example, children in high school going back to high school and being told to sit six feet away from each other in the cafeteria. My kids told me flat out that they wouldn't do that. Um, so like, how would you add a persuasive element, even when they clearly understand what the new guideline is? Awesome question. Um, I mean, pretty much it comes down to, it's the classic example of, to use a bad stereotype, the public health films from the 1950s and 60s, where, you know, some 45 year old bureaucrat was designing a film to tell teenagers how to behave themselves. Um, it's that audience delivery gap there. That credibility is created by what situation is this person in? What's it, what, why do young people not want to be six feet apart? Uh, I don't know about your young people, but my young people on two electronic devices could be six states apart and they wouldn't care. But it's asking that audience, well, what is it that's cueing your behavior in this space to want to behave that way? Explain to me why you're doing this. Help me recreate the narrative, the picture in my head that I used to understand why you're doing what you're doing. And using that picture, I can create something you can understand. And I think that's the key piece you were talking about. It's people do top down communication when it comes to public health. We've written it well, we've written it effectively, we've written it understandably, you understand. It needs to be more bottom up. Why are you behaving this way? What is guiding that behavior? What would make you want to change your behavior? What do we need to tell you in such a way that it taps into what you value in behavior that would make you change it? And you can only get that by researching the audience and asking them. And so I think that's gonna be the key thing. Uh, we do enough crowdsourcing now to build everything, it seems like. Why can't we start crowdsourcing how we communicate about public health, not in terms of content, but rhetorical style of delivery? So that when it comes to that, it's effective. Thanks, that's that's interesting. I like the idea of like looking at what the, what the person wants, what, what are their goals and trying to work from there uh, to try to kind of meet those goals. Um, I've definitely seen my, my kids uh, 
engage in really long group conversations on the phone for hours on end. So, uh, you know, uh, in order to meet their social goals, even when the physical distancing wasn't, wasn't allowed. And actually, I want to turn this question back on you, Tom and Swapnil, and everybody else here. Um, I'm bringing it up for one reason. Employment, when employment increases, people going back to school increases. So folks in my position kind of look at this and say, oh, this is going to get interesting. But what we are preparing for essentially is a new wave of student, very different, who's coming in at a very large number with very different life experiences at a very different point in their life that want a very different kind of education. They're very tech savvy now because many of them have worked online to an extent. And the question that I think you'll find folks like myself asking many of you who practice in industry a lot more is, what should we be teaching? How, in what ways, and how can we collaborate with you to provide education instead of create for you? Back to that audience dynamic. So I think you'll see that folks mentioned, you know, the grunt work that gets done. I think you're going to see education become part of that grunt work also as more educators begin to ask, how do we work with you to prepare the next generation of students for what's needed? I think, I think at the educational curriculum will drastically change. Uh, when I saw my kids go online, like the, the way the, the approach that the teachers and the class took just did not work. I mean, my students or my kids hated it. It was, it was drudgery. Right. And, and college is the same way. I've seen so many people just complain about endless work and, and just like having to listen to, to really dry lectures. And, and it's just not engaging. I think education, if it's going to be something that, that works, that engages people, um, is going to have to reinvent itself in a much more like student directed way. Uh, because right now it's, it's at least in, in our schools, it's certainly not working. Um, my nine-year-old just kind of stopped doing a lot of her homework. It's like shocking to us, but she just won't do it. It's just very, very boring. Um, and it needs to sort of tap into the student's own ability to direct their learning. I, I, I don't know. I, I'll be curious to see how, how that changes and what the tools are, because certainly whatever would work in that scenario could have an application to e-learning and others in, in instructional documentation scenarios. Um, thank you. Um, so I think we are done with all, all the questions in chat and uh, there was some comments back and forth, but uh, I think everything is handled. Uh, so back to you, Swapnam, thank you. All right, thanks, Goro. Uh, so hang on, we've got another question there from Am. I think he had a question in there about Tom. I think what search tools would you use with companies that want to implement search but keep their information private? So, do you have any specific uh, recommendations, Tom? Wait, that want to keep their information private? Is that what you said? Yeah. Oh, oh, uh, no. So, look, I'm not an expert in search. I just kind of mentioned it to try to give more personality. Uh, but I, I do think there are a couple huge players algolia is one and swift type is another search is emerging as a service and um there's just so much that you can mine from search analytics from these companies that you're not going to get through something like lunar uh like you want to be able to see what people are searching for what results they're finding be able to customize specific data sets to pro provide faceted filters you know like i i honestly want to take my docs to the next level by implementing an advanced search and uh I think that the tools are, are available kind of now. Now, there's a lot of different tools. Uh, like I said, I don't know the the search landscape that much. I'm sure uh, other things will work as well. But I, I do think um, even Flare, for example, has micro content. They're really kind of pushing that uh, because it has a better kind of interaction component. Um, I, I do think that's going to be a very fruitful area to explore, um, especially as people are looking for information. And if you can, if you can go to a company and say, "Look, I can implement faceted search, and and I will allow your your people to actually find information that they're looking for," I think that would be huge um, in terms of yeah. a persuasive portfolio skill. 
Cool. Thanks, Tom. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, but uh, I just wanted to say a quick thanks to Gaurav for moderating the questions and also Sarah for, the, for facilitating the discussion. Um, and a huge thanks to Tom and Kirk for joining us and providing a very healthy discussion of what's happening around the world and just in the technical communication industry and just, just in general in terms of, you know, what, what do technical communicators need to do um, to be more effective. So I uh, thank you both. Um, and like I previously mentioned on the meetup page, this meeting has been recorded and I will put it up on the Write the Docs YouTube channels and um, post out a link. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Swapnil and everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See ya. Thank you.